Hello, and welcome to the fourth video in this series on the ecology of the Kanto region. Today we'll be looking at what I've dubbed the Rock Tunnel Valley area. I'll be making use of conclusions I drew in the previous videos in the series, so if you've not seen them, I'd recommend going through them, starting from Pallet Town to Pewter City. But anyways, let's get started with the analysis. Heading east from Cerulean City and arriving at Route 9. Route 9 is very similar to a route I already covered, Route 4, with a similar balance for Rattata, Spiro, and either Ekans or Sandrew depending on the game. To go further into these Pokémon, I've said before that I think Rattata prey on bird eggs, and something I didn't mention was the Pokédex entries that say Ekans does the same. I've been pretty hard on the Pokédex entries so far, and I think I have been a bit too dismissive. Just because some entries are absurd doesn't mean I should ignore all of them. Ekans preying on bird eggs is completely reasonable, and as such, if it isn't contradicted by the game, I will consider it accurate. So far it does mesh in the sense that I proposed Spearow aren't as good protectors of their nests as Pidgey, and the birds Ekans have shared spaces with have been Spearow. However, if both Ekans and Rattata prey on eggs, then they should compete with each other, and perhaps exclude each other. I think the reason they can share space is that the eggs are the only way their niches overlap. For example, for other food sources, Rattatat may eat nuts and other plant matter, while Ekans prey on insects and small vertebrae. Spearow of course also need their share of those. With my newfound acceptance of the decks, bugs are specifically mentioned in red and blue, and supported by their level 1 peck. The remake dex entries are a little odd, referencing mirror move and them making screeching sounds. In terms of sound moves, the only move they learn is growl. Going back to the Pokedex slander for a moment, if I really wanted to convey these ideas, I'd give Spearow mirror move very early, and give them other sound moves like screech, roar, and uproar. There's a lot more room for ludonarrative synchronicity here. Those entries aren't quite as bad as some of Radicates though, which fit into a category of entries I like to call WOW facts. WOW fact entries are ones which probably have a basis in truth, but are hyperbolized or generalized in a manner that effectively makes them probably inaccurate. Radicate's yellow entry, for example, Its hind feet are webbed. They act as flippers so it can swim in rivers and hunt for prey. So, first off, what webbed feet? Okay, I like the idea of this entry. It would be a cool detail if there was any evidence for it, like if they could learn surf or some other water moves via TM or you could add it to a few pawns in the surfing Pokemon pool. Instead, it's just something stated out of nowhere. More likely, someone observed Eradicate swimming, simply to get across the body of water, and incorrectly extrapolated that they are semi-aquatic. I have no doubt that they could be very good swimmers, but I doubt they swim to the degree these dex entries are suggesting. Hence, a generalized, over-exaggerated, wow fact. I should praise a bit of good design here though. Our box entries mention its fierce markings, which we can not only plainly see, but more importantly, are backed up by mechanics. Intimidate is a clear mechanical representation of this trait. Interestingly, Ekans and Arbok both have this, for different reasons. Arbok's markings and Ekans' rattle. Interesting that a species would change its method of aposematism during its life. This is a nice meshing of the decks, visual design, and mechanics, and is how I think all Pokemon should be designed. Getting back on track, Ekans are only here for Red and Fire Red. Sanshu replaced them in the cool colored games. With the overlapping niches I suggested Ekans shares with Spearow and Ratata, we would expect to see some sort of shift in the latter's presence with Ekans gone, unless Sanshu had a similar impact. It doesn't have to be in the exact same way, but it seems that they do compete with both. They probably don't eat Spiro eggs. With their digging abilities, I would suspect that they dig up insects and grubs and such. They'd likely outcompete Spiro for ground-based insects as food. Spiro still have an advantage on flying insects though. They may also supplement their diet with nuts, tubers, mushrooms, and any other such vegetation, which would compete with Rattata. Though Rattata are likely more generalist and could also be impacted by them preying on insects. There is another Pokemon that fills this slot in yellow, Nidoran. There's an odd through line between the three, with all learning Poison Sting very early. I've said before that I think Poison Sting is a great defense tool, but this commonality would suggest that either they're being preyed on by something susceptible to it, or there's some resource that is uniquely exploitable by Poison Sting. The former could only really be Adult Raticate or Fero, which could prey on weak Ekans, Sandshrew, or Nidoran. Considering it's learned pretty early, I think this is plausible. 
They aren't particularly weak to it, but it would make attacking the young of these species a risk, more so than say a Firo attacking a young Rattata. Unlike Sandshrew, Nidoran seemed to completely upset the balance here. Spiro and Ratatat are at about half their normal ratios, which suggests that Nidoran are really clogging up the area. Other than the Safari Zone, which is a bit of a weird place, this and the next area I'll be looking at are the last we'll see of Nidos in the Kanto region. If we mark their locations in the game on a map, we can see a general sort of migration which happens between the games. They seem to go to Mount Moon during the time of the remix, and then flow out to the surrounding areas during Gen 1. Route 9 as a region seems to be similar to Route 22, somewhat mountainous. I suggested that Route 22 is where they made it, and I think the same thing is true here. The only question is, where are they during Blue and Red? The only good answer I have is that they moved off the map, which actually isn't that crazy. It would make sense for their path between here and Mount Moon to be indirect, because Cerulean City blocks the direct one so they may have to awkwardly go around it now that it exists. Going around the mountains likely takes longer, hence why they aren't here in blue and have to leave before red. As I've said before, I believe this is the order of the games, at least from a seasonal perspective. Anyways, let's see what we can get from Route 10. Rather than a path through the hills like Route 9, it seems to be more like a valley, hence the title I've given this video. At first glance, the Pokemon distribution seems similar to Route 9, until you realize that's not Rattata, that's Voltorb. What are they doing here? So I won't dance around the power plant, because I'm going to be talking about it later. It's a power plant, a human-made structure. Unless Pokemon evolve really fast, the Pokemon there are either put there or drawn there. They didn't evolve there. I say that now because the Voltorb here are here because of that. They're an invasive species. Notably, Route 10 and the Power Plant are the only places they're present in these games, so I don't think Voltorb are Kanto Pokemon, in the sense that they're not from here. What I mean is I suggested back in Viridian Forest that Pikachu might have evolved a lot of their traits because of that environment. If so, they would be distinctly from Kanto, and invasive elsewhere. Voltorb is the opposite, being from some other region and either migrating or being brought here. So with that in mind, if they fit in nicely here, they must have taken over some other Pokemon's niche, which in this case seems to be Rattata. And what if I suggest Rattata do? Prey on Spiro eggs. Their typing would make them theoretically good at dealing with Spiro. They may not eat eggs, but they would at least be a threat to them. However, they don't actually get an electric move in Gen 1, only Gen 3. Again, this is a point where the decks and the mechanics do not mesh, and Gen 1 they can't zap people. They didn't even have static yet. So they might zap birds, but it doesn't seem like a primary goal. It seems more likely that they're very good foragers, eating whatever they find laying on the ground, and in that sense, competing with Rattata. They have additional advantages in their defense mechanisms. The red-white coloration is clearly apposematism to warn about their explosiveness. If I saw a Voltorb in the wild, I'd back away. I don't want to blow up. Much like animals being poisonous, other creatures would quickly learn to leave your species be if you start blowing up in their face. I think this is how they've pushed out Rattata. Arbok and Firo will likely prefer to hunt a plain old rat than a ball that's likely to explode. So the Rattata get pressured from food competition, and they get more pressure from hunting, and eventually have to just leave. I think the reason why Voltorb haven't expanded to Route 9 is a little more mechanical in a physics sense. They don't have limbs, their method of movement is going to have to be rolling. I'm not really sure how the biomechanics of that would work, but I imagine it would not fare well in a hilly environment. They may keep their good speed, but only in one direction. They also interestingly have light screen and mirror coat, suggesting a need for special defense, which is not required here. But as I said, these Pokemon are out of their element. There's going to be some seemingly useless traits that were useful back where they come from. Since they're placed in Rattata's niche, they'll also need to have some amount of competition with Ekans. I don't see a clear answer to this, there's not a lot in common between the two, they can both paralyze I guess. So I'll just throw out one idea. Where do Voltorb sleep? With their convenient shape, perhaps small holes in the burrows of other animals. Snakes like Ekans would probably have similar spaces they want to live. So rather than food, the two may compete for living space. Sandshrew would have a similar situation, but would be a little less scared of Voltorb both due to their higher defense to sometimes withstand explosions, and their ground type negating any electric moves they may have if they even do have them, 
So I don't think they'd be as worried about them invading burrows, but there'd still be some competition. Fun side math, because Voltorb and Electrode are perfect spheres, we can easily calculate their densities. Using Electrode's height as a diameter and its weight as its weight, we get a density of 74 kilograms per meter cubed. Honestly, if I even did convert that into Imperial, would that actually help any of you Americans understand what this means? Far more useful is comparisons. According to Wikipedia, Styrofoam has a density of 75 kilograms per meter cubed. Very similar. So Electrode should feel a lot similar to Styrofoam. Fortunately, they're not lighter than air, much lighter than water though. Uh, Volter are a bit heavier, uh, and over twice as dense, 160 kilograms per meter cubed, which Wikipedia does not have a nice comparison for, but I guess they're still lighter than cork. Okay, so onto the weird part. Yellow. No Spiro, no Voltorb, no Ekans or Sandshrew. We've got Nidoran, like in Route 9, Radata, Magnemite, and Machop. Let's go through these. Nidoran are the easiest, I already talked about them. They're here because Route 9 is probably at its carrying capacity and they've come here. Why no Spiro? Magnemite are much more prominent with electric moves than Voltorb, learning at least Thundershock in Gen 1. That has obvious implications for a flying type. However, from the fact that the Magnemite didn't follow the Spiro, it's clear that they don't hunt them or anything, they just are a threat. Radtent probably took their niche back from the absent Voltorb, which means we have to explain why the Voltorb are gone. It once again might be Magnemite, who, while still taking a good chunk of damage from the explosions, could consistently live them thanks to their steel typing, which... Okay, so type changes. Fairy type is not a problem here. Of course, there are Pokemon that will become fairies, but fairy type is nowhere to be seen. It would be a little silly to go back and pretend that fairy type does exist here. It'd be very weird to pretend that these Pokemon have different resistances and weaknesses than they do and have different stab types. All to just retroactively add in what is effectively a retcon. So yeah, no, fairy's fine, it's not a problem yet. Moves also change type, but that along with stat ability and moveset changes can be rationalized easily by slight differences in behavior. Behavioral changes don't require any major changing of attributes in the creatures, so as such I treat these things as just variations that can occur within a species. But then we have Magnemite. They aren't steel type in Gen 1, they are in Gen 3. They function differently in each, and I'm trying to reconcile that, but I don't know how. <laughs> okay, here's my best idea. Abandoned power plant. Looks the part, and stated to be so, but they're not at the location. We have like three generators and a lot of storage space. Fuel, I guess? But if this is fuel, why is the power plant here, so secluded from everything? It doesn't seem to use the water. This isn't an idea Pokemon fans will likely scoff at. The Magnemite and Voltorb were brought here by humans to generate power. It's here in the hills because grouping so many Pokemon in a city could be dangerous. So these were perhaps domesticated Magnemites, or at least were attempted to be. And here's the actual idea. Something about this domestication has caused them to lose their metal shells. This could be a number of things, perhaps very specific purposeful bioengineering, it could be accidental in the sort of like, lack of nutrients from poor domestication conditions, it could be a genetic defect caused by a small population, or it could be they simply take off the shells manually. <laughs> So what are the other differences between the Gen 1 non-Steel type Magnemite and the Gen 3 Steel type ones? Metal Sound is a move they get at level 1, which, while not maybe outright dangerous, could be very annoying and distracting. I imagine a lot of Magnemite spamming Metal Sound could do damage to hearing at least. They're also stuck with just Tackle as an attacking move for much longer, allowing them to skip or push off Thundershock, Supersonic, and Sonic Boom, potentially making them less of a threat before they are trained. Assuming training is how they were going about doing it, instead of like strapping them into large contraptions to suck the electricity out. They also don't have Magnet Pull in Gen 1, which theoretically, depending on how much control they have, could cause a lot of problems with them getting stuck in machinery or perhaps breaking machinery, who knows. However, this seems to have come at the cost of their electrical generating capabilities, as Thundershock is their only naturally learned electric move. I mean, they can still potentially use TMs like Thunderbolt, but that is expensive, that will cost money in order to train each one. So then, if this is all true, then Leaf Green and Fire Red have to take place a little bit after Red, Blue, and Yellow. Perhaps a couple years. The Magnemite may have gone through a generation, or just regained their shells naturally. 
This only works as an idea because near the power plant is the only place in Kanto they exist, other than Cerulean Cave, which I already discussed in the last video, is a little weird. The magneton there are likely from the power plant. As such, this group of magnemite are the only ones available in Gen 1, for both you and all NPCs. This does not contradict my seasonal hypothesis, as that only requires the games to be in different parts of the year, not all of them being in the same year in sequence. Some other things about magnemite. They're definitely biological, since they can mate with Ditto. Magneton can't actually be three magnemites like the deck suggests, because they can happen in captivity, anywhere. Deep in a cave and your magnemite hits 30? I guess a pair of friends just happen to be waiting for it down there. I think a better explanation is that their reproduction method is asexual, with them budding off magnemite. Magneton form when such a reproduction doesn't fly off, but instead gets stuck to the parent, and the two become one in some way. Theoretically, there could be magnetons out there with two, four, or many more magnemites. Also, as I discussed in my video on Pokemon breeding, I believe all Pokemon have the ability to sexually reproduce, but ones like magnemite have developed additionally the ability to reproduce asexually, and thus primarily do so outside of some very specific circumstances with Ditto. They also don't eat electricity. If I wanted to show that they do so, I'd give them Volt Absorb. As it stands, they take damage from electricity. You could theoretically argue that they have to absorb it in a certain way, and that statement is kind of like saying, oh, I threw an apple at a squirrel and it ran away, so they obviously don't eat apples. But there's still no sign that that's what they eat, not even in the Pokedex for these games. Even if this was their food source, where are they getting it from? The abandoned power plant? It's not really generating anything. The only option would be other electric types, which Voltorb, as previously stated, doesn't have a lot in terms of electric moves, so it's only Pikachu and Electabuzz and none are on Route 10 with Magnemite. Levitating. They can be hit by ground moves, but are both said to float, and clearly are floating. This is fine, mainly because they have two types that fit very well, and a very fitting ability. There's just not room for Levitate or the Flying type. This is just a consequence of that. If they are going to have a second ability, it probably should be Levitate though, or at least a hidden ability. So why did Magnemite stay here? After the plant was abandoned, why didn't they just fly off? Well, remember that storage space in the power plant? It probably actually is fuel, just not directly. It's food for the Magnemites and other Pokemon. The question then is, what actually is it? I have no idea. It seems to last a long time. It must be cheap for them to have so much. And I just had the worst idea. So this is the logic I went down. What metal is Magnemite made of? Whatever it is, we should expect it to get said metal from its environment. Because of Magnet Pull, all steel types have to be made of a ferromagnetic metal, assuming Magnet Pull is accurate to being a magnet. Magnemite is like the one potential exception to that, since its electric type would mean its magnetism could come from electromagnetism, which doesn't require such a metal, but as far as I'm aware, is made much stronger by the presence of it, so it probably does have a ferromagnetic metal in it. There's not that many options for such a metal, the main three being iron, nickel, and cobalt. Iron is the standout. It's something we take note of in food, so perhaps there's an iron-rich food out there that could feed them. So let's take a look into iron-rich foods. Ooh, meats that could be meat-eaters, that's fun. Uh, beans, um, I guess maybe vegetables and fruits, could they be around here? They're not gonna have cereals. Seafood I kinda like, like maybe if it's, they could eat from the water, it would fit with their electric type, but wait a second. Why do we need iron? That's a biology one, I don't have to look that one up. Iron is important for our cardiovascular system. Iron allows our red blood cells to take in oxygen so that they can be transported elsewhere in the body. Your blood is rich with the stuff. Vampire Magnemite. I'd say hear me out, but that's honestly the extent of it. Uh, assuming Pokemon blood is red, it could be a decent source of iron to support Magnemite's shell growth. How does it suck blood? Um, extendable proboscis? That sounds weird, but if it's solid food that they eat, we have the same problem. But a proboscis is much easier to hide away. It's a plentiful resource, Route 10 shows them going out to get some, swarming around like mosquitoes. Uh, that's actually something to address with this idea. Are they like mosquitoes drinking the blood of awake animals, or vampire bats sucking blood from sleeping animals? Or they could even drink the blood of dead animals. Well, 
Metal Sound and Sonic Boom are particularly loud, which doesn't allude to stealth, uh, and that would be definitely required to drink blood from any sort of live source, awake or asleep. They're most likely drinking blood of dead animals, probably a mix of both scavenging and, when necessary, hunting and killing. From that, their entire diet would probably most likely look like that of a butterfly. So any other sorts of liquids that contain nutrients they need, like nectar or sap. Blood is probably just more of their diet than it is for butterflies. The idea is highly speculative, but there's a gap here which requires explanation, and I think it's the simplest solution. Like, what are the other options? They chew on rocks? We still have a mouth problem there. Electroplating? I guess maybe if there's enough iron floating around in the water. Okay, so what was I even talking about before that? I got like three tangents deep. Uh, oh right, why are the Pokemon that are on Route 10 there? Uh, I was in the middle of using Magnemite as the reason for Voltorb not being there. If they do sometimes prey on Voltorb for blood, then we can see that there's a couple reasons that wouldn't be too ideal for the Voltorb. One, that very low density we talked about. There can't be a lot of blood if there is any blood in there. So maybe a little bit of blood sucks means basically death. Additionally, as I was going into, Voltorb's defense mechanisms aren't too great against Magnemite. If it does have electric moves, Magnemite resists those, and explosion, Magnemite is one of the few things that can live that. And if you don't care about the defense mechanisms, then apostomatism is a negative. Magnemite don't specifically prey on Voltorb, but they're just the best option when they're around. So when they're gone, they just shift to other options. Machop are gracefully very straightforward. With fighting type being super effective against rock and steel types, it makes it clear that developing this type is a great way for Pokemon to get through such defensive developments, where normal moves fail. With that, they've come out to prey on the prominent Magnemite, cracking up their steel shells. Oh shit, this is yellow. Um, they don't have their steel shells yet. To crack open those normal type Rattataz. <laughs> okay. So let's travel on down to the power plant. The Magnemite, Pikachu, and Voltorb numbers are pretty consistent, with only the addition of Electabuzz and Grimer being any different. So, as I said, I think the power plant was made to utilize electric Pokémon to generate power. Among the electric types here, I think each were brought to try out and see what is the most effective for said purpose. So let's look into the pros and cons of each in such a theoretical scenario. Outside of the power plant, Pikachu are the only mons local to Kanto, which is a plus for accessibility. But they aren't particularly common there. Getting enough Pikachu out of the forest may be difficult. Additionally, they have the lowest special attack out of any of the options, alluding to a lower amount of power generated, which of course can be increased from evolution, but since that takes a Thunderstone, that costs money. What they do have is the only level 1 electric move in Gen 1. In Gen 3, other Pokemon get early options, but while Voltorb and Magnemite get 65 power Spark, Pikachu get 95 power Thunderbolt and later on get Thunder at 41. So decent power overall, if you're both willing to pay for their evolution and are able to get enough of them. They seem to have successfully got them, and while we do find Raichu here in Gen 1, I was wrong in my last video to say that Cerulean Case was unique on that front, it's not the majority of them. My guess would be that they tried them, found the evolution cost wasn't worth it, and gave up. Voltor doesn't get electric moves in Gen 1, why would they bring them here if they couldn't generate anything? Well, like how Magnemite changed in captivity, I think Voltorb might have experienced a similar effect. And I mean, if you're gonna try to domesticate Voltorb, there's definitely a trait I would try to get rid of, that being their explosiveness. So perhaps such things were attempted and failed miserably to the point where they did not get rid of the explosiveness and did get rid of their electric moves. With that in mind, it's clear that Voltorb were probably a failure as well. Oh, and about mistaking Voltorbs for items. It doesn't make any sense. So Voltorb do kind of superficially look like Pokeballs, yes. But they're much larger than them, so it doesn't really make sense to make that mistake. Also, most items on the ground are only represented by Pokeballs. They aren't actually Pokeballs. It doesn't really make any sense for the player character to think they're items. It only works in a metagame sense, a way to trick the player, which I greatly dislike, but it does make sense for a creature with such distinct apismatism to have an instinct to sit still and prominent when in the face of a threat, attempting to scare them away. So this behavior of them sitting still is fine, it's just the fact that we don't realize it's a Voltorb until we touch it. 
Magna might have the best special attack out of the options, and that's not just as Magneton. Magna might is a tide with Electabuzz in higher than Raichu. Their move options are lesser than Pikachu's, but still okay, they at least get a Gen 1 electric move. As I described in detail earlier, there was some attempts at domesticating them, getting rid of their problems, perhaps, uh, and it resulted in perhaps some unintended consequences. And I honestly think that the most likely cause of this was just not feeding them blood. Looking at the logic of real life farming, we don't farm carnivores because it's extremely inefficient. You won't farm animals to eat plentiful, easily acquired resources like grass and hay and mainly just plants. If Magnemite required blood, then they might be very inefficient for this purpose. On top of that, there might be a sort of aversion to the idea of feeding blood to them due to a perceived grossness in it. So they didn't feed them blood, they weren't able to get enough iron to make their shells, and things suffered because of that. Finally, Electabuzz. They're much less common than the others, leading me to believe that just a few were brought in to experiment on, if even that. The plant was probably shut down before they could really be tested. But I don't actually think Electabuzz were experiments, or at least that's not why they're here mainly because they seem to be migratory, only coming in during Red and Fire Red. Now, quite a few of its Pokedex entries mention that it is drawn to electrical grids and power plants to eat electricity, but it doesn't have Volt Absorb. Also, this is from Ruby and Sapphire, but its entries in those games say they're used as lightning rods, but they don't even have lightning rod as an ability. That is so infuriating. However, that doesn't mean what these say aren't completely untrue. The eat electricity may be a misconception that comes from them being attracted to such electrically charged locations, like power plants and such. But why would they go there if not to eat the electricity? My current hypothesis is that they are specialized to hunt other electric types. You may think an electric type hunter should be ground type, but evolution isn't a skill tree that lets you choose the best option. I believe that ancestors of Electabuzz were normal type, and a niche opened up somewhere for them to hunt electric types. Any of the four types that resist electricity would be useful in such a scenario, and I think electric was just the first to mutate. Of poison types in real life, I, I mean poisonous animals in real life, god I have brain rot, uh, of them, a common way for them to get said poison is through eating other poisonous animals or plants. It's not a crazy stretch for electricity and Pokemon to potentially function in a similar manner, with their electricity coming from their electric prey. They notably are not born with an electric move. Without some major mechanical additions, it would be kind of difficult to display that they only get electric moves under specific conditions. The more important thing is that it might explain the electric eating, if perhaps they could substitute preying on electric Pokemon with chewing on electric wires. Gaining defense mechanisms, in their case, has more value than taking some damage. This will likely lead to an electric immunity ability in the future, perhaps something like, I don't know, Motor Drive. Also, if they ate it from wires and not other Pokemon, why would they come to an abandoned power plant? Of the Pokemon they have the potential to prey on, Pikachu and Voltorb have fairly low physical bulk, and Electabuzz have Quick Attack, Swift, and Decent Attack. Along with Leer and Scratch, which definitely support a physical focus, this could make them decent at taking them out. Explosion, while not always a one hit at an even level, would definitely make Pikachu the more ideal prey. Magnemite is probably resistant enough to be not too worried about their physical attacks. And then we have Grimer, here in yellow, for some reason. As I said with my Magnemite steel type change rationalization, I think each of the gens do have a time gap between them, and I think yellow is a little bit after red and blue. The latter being fairly soon after the plant closes, with yellow being a bit after that. Just enough time for these Grimer to move in and eat the limited amount of refuse and such that were left there, and the remakes being after said resource ran out. So garbage and sludge. What Grimer and Muck are said to eat in the Pokedex. They don't eat literally all garbage, but instead just like you might say a raccoon eats garbage. There's nutrients to be found in there, and if they have a resistance to diseases and bacteria and such from, say, a poison typing, then they could exploit said resource with little risk. Before humans, they were likely omnivorous, opportunistic scavengers, and saw an explosion when humans created an ideal niche for them. And the fire red entry says, uh, where does this nonsense even come from? Like, when did the moon start generating x-rays? Like, I, I guess it reflects x-rays from the sun. It's, it's just an absurd myth. 
they can reproduce with other Pokemon. They're not just radioactive sludge turned animate. More likely, they're a very slimy sort of slug thing, with the sliminess being more a thick layer of mucus on top of the actual body. It can't be purely slime, because we clearly see eyes, a mouth, and a tongue, and the latter two imply a body cavity of some sort. The toxic mucus which covers them, along with their notable stench, are defense mechanisms. I don't really have much to say about Grimer, at least not in this environment, so not yet. There's one last Pokemon in the power plant, Zapdos. I talked about Mewtwo last time, but I think there's a few things I need to clear up in regards to legendaries. So it seems to be a common thought that there's only one of each legendary, and I don't actually think that's an idea that is supported by the text in question, i.e. the games. So where does this idea come from? It's mainly from two things. There's only one of each catchable in any game, and it seems they can't reproduce. So that seems pretty straightforward. There's only one of them, but there's also a limited number of plenty of other Pokemon. The starters, for example. There are other trainers that have the starters, but that isn't the case for, say, Snorlax. There are two, but unless I'm mistaken, no trainers have them in Leaf Green and Fire Red. And more importantly, they are encountered in the same way as the legendaries. So if we use the single legendary as a reason for there being only one, then the same logic should suggest that there are only two Snorlax. However, there's also breeding. We can't breed Zapdos, we can breed Snorlax. The legendaries can breed with neither Ditto or themselves, so... Wait... How did we get two legendaries? Simple, we traded for them. Yeah, there are more than one of each legendary, there's just only one available in each game. Now, to that, you may think of the following. Each game is a separate universe, you're effectively trading over another universe's legendary, so it doesn't count. And to that, I say... Which of these following premises is more absurd? Firstly, my idea that they're just rare. The assumptions required to make that work are simply that they're very picky breeders, rationalizing why they don't breed in captivity. Or the other idea, there are only one of each legendary, which would require the following assumptions. The multiverse is canon, with each copy of a game being its own multiverse. Pokemon can be transferred between said multiverses, and said transfer is normalized to the point where it's an everyday occurrence and is not referenced at all in the games. Legendaries are seemingly immortal, unique creatures created at some point in the past. And finally, said immortal creatures can be captured in a Pokeball by a 10-year-old. Let's just use Occam's Razor for a quick second here and see that legendaries as one member of a species just make more sense. Also, the animation of trading doesn't support a multiverse idea because it happens when you trade with NPCs. And if you can trade between multiverses, it seems a little odd that there's a plot point in making a big machine to trade between regions. That seems like something that should have been solved already. On top of that, I just like the idea that players you trade with are just average trainers you meet, much better than them being alternate universe versions of you. It's more fun, and it tells a better story. So, Zapdos. Big, strong Thunderbird. Their electric typing could make them very good at hunting either other birds, or aquatic water types. To me, the shape of their beak seems to be most akin to a crane or kingfisher. Either way, good for grabbing fish. So, Zapdos' strategy likely revolves around them zapping water, stunning or killing fish, and then flying them off to be eaten. Thus, they likely live in coastal regions, or lakes large enough to support prey for them. The river sort of thing here that separates the power plant from the rest of the world... Uh, why is the power plant here? Like, how did the workers commute here? Like, okay, I don't, I don't care, this is an ecological analysis, not a civil planning one. Uh, but yeah, the body of water likely has enough to support them, so they didn't leave after the power plant shut down. I mean, yeah, why else would a Zapdos live here specifically if it wasn't captured by humans and attempted to be used in this Pokemon power plant? Perhaps that was even the reason for the closure, that idea failing very badly. Uh, I'm guessing that Zapdos are probably territorial with other members of their species. After all, other birds couldn't really pose much of a threat to them, so why else would they need attacks like Detect and Light Screen? Pressure as an ability is an example of a sort of trait that I'd like to address. Those that, rather than being a specific useful adaptation, are more of a consequence of other factors. Zapdos is the top of the food chain, and with that, you'd best bet that anything a giant yellow lightning bird swoops down on is going to be kind of scared, and probably will be a little rushed and nervous in anything they do. Hence, less efficient use of their moves, showing to me desperation. I like Zapdos quite a bit, they're very cohesive, nothing odd or which requires a weird explanation, other than their nature as legendaries, but that's fine. With that, the power plant is finished, and onto the final area of this area, Rock Tunnel. There's two floors to Rock Tunnel, but they're mostly the same. 
just some slight differences in distribution. Onyx seemed to prefer the deeper level, but that's about it. So Zubat and Geodude are kind of the core cave Pokemon. We also saw them back at Mount Moon, where I hypothesized that Geodude hunt Zubat, using their rock typing and ambush tactics from their camouflaged appearance. I'm pretty happy with my conclusions back at Mount Moon. There's only two things I'd like to address. Firstly, my newfound acceptance is shout the Pokedex. Are there any interesting entries? For Geodude, not really. Uh, Golem has an entry involving it being able to withstand dynamite, which I don't actually think is hyperbole for once. I mean, it can withstand explosions quite well, thanks to its resistance and high defense. This is fine. Zubat does have entries mentioning it as blind. This is a clear example of something that could easily be a myth, since of course this is based on the misconception that bats are blind. Yeah, we can't see eyes on the sprite, but Golbat clearly do have eyes. What advantage would come from being blind for the first part of your life? I mean, I guess if there was a major change in lifestyle, but Golbat also seemed to live in caves and lack any changes to type or major move additions that could justify such a change. Golbat has its own interesting entries, which say it drinks blood. And yeah, actually, Leech Life is a move that could indicate such a scenario. The weakness of the move could say that they have methods similar to vampire bats, as I've unfortunately already gone over in this video for some reason, i.e. they feed on sleeping animals. I think they have a more mixed diet, also including other prey, but blood could definitely be something that they drink when needed. Machop and Mankey, their fighting type makes them perfect for preying on Geodude and Onyx, pretty simple. I already went over this, fighting types seem to be the go-to to crack open hard shells of rock and steel types. Between the two fighters, the dynamic is actually quite interesting. The two have the same base stat total and evolve at the same level. Once evolved though, Primeape is stronger than Machoke with Machoke only having better HP and defense. It's a difference that might not be obvious because you'd generally compare Primeape to Machamp, but being a trade evolution means it's not something we'd see in the wild. So why is Machop the prominent Pokemon here with Mankey only being temporary? First, Mankey are migratory, and they have a very interesting migration which I'll get to in the future, mainly thanks to them being version exclusives in Gen 1, but not Gen 3. They leave the cave because they want to go somewhere else, but it is a good source of rock types while they're here. Machop can keep up with this because they have better fighting moves. Gen 1 Mankey only gets Seismic Toss as a fighting move. They get Low Kick at it in yellow, but in Gen 3 there's no fighting move that Mankey get that Machop don't. I think the best way to rationalize this is to say that Machop have been fighting types for longer. It was evolved by Mankey more recently and thus they haven't as fully developed fighting abilities. Now, what evolving fighting type means is a little odd but we can see it as more of a behavioral evolution, with them learning techniques they can perform. Machop family dex entries are just a little silly. Most are hyperbolic. Machoke don't actually never get tired, they just have a lot of endurance. These Machamp ones are just over-exaggerations. But there are a few weird ones regarding Machoke's belt. The belt around its waist holds back its energy. Without it, this Pokemon would be unstoppable. The question to that would be, do they have them in the wild? If not, then why aren't wild Machoke unstoppable? If so, then where do they come from? Is it even a belt, or is it just part of them that looks like a belt? Based on this entry, I'd guess the last scenario, as to me, such a thought seems likely to arise from seeing odd parts on wild Pokemon and speculating about them. It's an idea that can't be tested because they can't be removed. It's just coincidental that there seems to be a P on them. In reality, it's likely a bit of display hair. The bigger the P, the more enticing the Machoke is as a mate. To understand why Machoke evolves into Machamp after trading, there are a few visual traits to look into. The forearms is the most prominent one. It does show that there is some significant development going on here, causing it to grow these. However, I think a more useful change for figuring it out is the mouth. Machoke seem to have a more reptilian mouth, whereas Machamp seems to be almost more of a beak. I think it's more likely that other closely related Pokemon did not have beaks, so I don't think they're pedomorphic. They also lose toes? Honestly, overall, it seems like a pop culture version of rapid mutation from something like radiation. And in the end, I don't know. I don't really have a good explanation for this odd set of characteristics. Perhaps it's just an odd set of mutations that are caused by some specific interaction with a specific substance that humans in this universe happen to expose it to. That's what I lean towards. But I haven't really convinced myself either. Until I do, Machamp is just kind of weird. Onyx, despite sharing a type and location with you, dude, doesn't seem to be anything like it. I mean, look at that stat line. I mean, they share a high defense, but that's about where it ends. Onyx is all around kind of weird. Absurdly high defense, with its only other stat that isn't bad being speed of all things. 
it can survive a few physical hits and then run away, that's about it. So Onyx is not likely to be a predator of other Pokemon. It's described as a burrowing creature, digging out tunnels and churning through earth. It likely gets its nutrients through this, consuming that which it digs through, absorbing any small creatures and nutrients it picks up, and likely taking some minerals as well to form its hard shell, and excreting what's left. It's kind of like a big earthworm. Steelix is in a Gen 1 Pokemon, but it's worth mentioning here, as it likely comes from Onyx eating the metal coat used in its evolution. From that high concentration of metals, it makes a metal shell. If that's the case, then Steelix may actually exist in the wild if an onyx eats enough iron-rich rocks, though it would take a lot longer since they don't have a nice little metal ingot to give them all the coat they need. I think most of onyx's moves just naturally come from its attributes. A big long snake-like creature is of course going to be able to use its body to bind other creatures in place. Iron Tail supports my Steelix hypothesis by suggesting that, as onyx, they have some steelish attributes. Dragon Breath is a little bit weird. Rather than its own trait though, I think Dragon Breath is a remnant of what it once was. Onyx didn't start out without legs. Its ancestors went from some other strategy to burrowing, specifically with its mouth as opposed to four legs. And like a snake, it lost its legs since it didn't need them. Dragon Breath shows us that its ancestors were likely dragons, or at least Pokemon that had a reason to use Dragon Breath. Though useless for damage, its ability to paralyze could make it a useful tool for Onyx. Thus, it's remained as a semi-vestigial trait. They're likely preyed upon by fighting types, just like Geodude, but rather than stealth, they use speed to get away. The rarity also likely comes from the fact that they spend most of their time digging through the earth, and we only see them when they briefly emerge. And the final Pokemon here is... Ditto. Only in the Japanese version of Blue, though. I've been kinda counting those, but I'm gonna veto Ditto for now. This one's long enough already. Each of these videos has just been getting bigger and bigger. Also, it's been over a year since I started this series now, and I'm not far enough into it. Next time, I'm going to cover the areas around Saffron City, as well as a few of the other areas stowed away in the middle of Kanto. Hope you can survive until whenever that's out. Nonetheless, I do appreciate all the support, both just complimentary comments and any comments that are engaging with the premise and discussing their thoughts on looking at Pokemon ecologically. Thanks everyone for watching.